Well, folks, I'm very, very happy to be sharing this time with you today, and I look forward to discussing a number of things. In fact, um, the way that I'm sort of conceptualizing how we'll spend the second portion of this is very much open for interpretation and sort of changes in direction. So we can sort of decide how we spend that workshop time, whether it's leaning more towards music straight ahead or applications of technology, how we understand ourselves in the music industry. Um, there's a lot to explore. I'll say it like that. But the first thing I want to start off with before I even get to an introduction of myself and a real introduction of the of the thing that we're going to be talking about today is I want to ask you folks a question. And uh, I think it would be wise for us to either write this down or to take it down in our phones. So if you could just take just a moment and get out either a writing utensil or a mobile device, um, just something to take down a couple of questions that I'm going to ask you and I want for you to ponder them over and then write down a response. So take about 20 seconds and get something out that'll work for that. And the question, the specific question that I want for you to pond over is, what's the question that you're too afraid to ask because you should have known the answer already? I'm going to explain the, I'm going to ask the question again, and then I'm going to explain the question. What's the question that you're too afraid to ask because you should have known the answer already? It's a little bit of story time. Uh, I went to music school, got a bachelor's music degree um, when I was 17 years old, or I graduated when I was 21, but glad it got in. Same age as most of you when you first got into got into school, got into an undergraduate degree. And when I got there, what I didn't realize until uh, maybe theory two was that I did not have a good understanding of what a dominant seventh chord was. Because in a dominant seventh chord in the key of C, right, if you're thinking about uh, a five chord, which is a G, on if you play all the white keys in a tetrachord, Starting from G, you'll make a dominant seventh chord. But in most other keys, that is not the case. So I would always come up short in other keys, not quite understanding exactly what the um, sort of fundamentals were that held that chord and that chord designation together. But I was terrified, utterly terrified. I was too terrified to ask those in my class, lest they think that I'm less than, lest, that I, lest they think that I can't hold my own um, harmonically uh, or in other ways of understanding music. I was too afraid to ask the teacher versus they think the same thing and, and knock me down a few pegs, in, few pegs in front of everybody or um, you know, set me on a different uh, curricular tra trajectory. And I was too afraid to ask the folks outside of the classroom because I didn't want them to think that I, you know, my entire musical upbringing was, was less than. So I'm asking you between the privacy of you and the thing that you're writing on, or let's say your electronic device, what's the question or questions that you're, you've been too afraid to ask? We can keep it in this room if we'd like to. Music, technology, um, business. What are the questions that you're too afraid to ask because you, and I quote, air quotes, should have known the answer already. Take about 20 seconds. I'm not going to make you folks say those questions, uh, say those answers. Days, you don't have to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> However, we How may we come, back, come to back to them later. later. Okay? okay. So, so what I want to move on to is, is an understanding, understanding of how we can possibly, possibly, how we can possibly understand how to interface with technology through a sort of a metaphor. Uh, and that metaphor would be reductive EQing. If you're not familiar with what reductive EQing is, this goes by a bunch of different names, but this is essentially the practice of editing audio through a parametric EQ and um, essentially taking out some of the nasty nodes that can really be in there. You might be saying, well, what are the nasty nodes that can be in an audio signal? Um, well, there are plenty of them, typically at least one or two, especially in a, a vocalized audio uh, source. And if you sort of fish them out of signal, it can make for a much clearer resonant sound. So I want to use that analogy to impact both the way that we think about technology and also the way that we think about careers. Because um, as Professor Schaefer just said, 
a big part of my um, shtick is understanding success and understanding how people make a life for themselves. That's really, um, that's full of meaningful connections and, and meaningful connective uh, interfaces. So I thought I would just share a little bit of a visual and hopefully um, this audio also comes through to you. Uh, I have very few things to share in this way. So again, hopefully this works pretty well. So this is a digital audio workstation. Can you folks see that okay? Yeah. Great, yeah. wonderful. Can anyone, um, uh, you may have to do some translation for me. Anyone from the room, anyone from the room know which program this is? You're getting a mixed response of Logic and GarageBand and anything else? Yeah. One of those two, they say. Right on. Yeah, definitely one of those two. Uh, you can tell that it's logic, just like the extra buttons that are here. When they're held side by side, it's a little easier to tell. But when you're, you know, pulling them um, out of thin air, they can be much more difficult to tell. And that's certainly on purpose. Remember, uh, I mean, maybe some of you have never been told that you can always open up GarageBand files in Logic should you ever need to do that. Because I know that for a lot of us, technological transitions are very, very difficult. I've seen people through... Uh, technological transitions from digital audio workstations, like from using um, GarageBand to Logic or Ableton or Pro Tools, or from using something like um, in-person, in-real-life paper to transitioning to an iPad or another type of a tablet. And the transition period, the way that people sort of deal with that transition can be very, very similar, sort of a um, uh, holding on to the to the relic of the past, which totally makes sense. We've developed a way of understanding that totally is reminiscent of that past, but uh, it helps to understand how the new ways can make your life a lot easier. Okay, so this particular um, audio interface, like I said, our digital audio workstation is Logic. I'm just going to make sure that you can hear all the things that need to be heard. And then I'm just going to play the very beginning of this for you, okay? And this is a tune called My Way. And now the end is near And so I face the final curtain I'm assuming that you folks can hear that. I'm assuming you can get the general picture of how this piece goes for right now. Okay? I said something about reductive EQing at the very, very beginning of this. And it's something that if you don't know anything about it from the onset, you have no reason to go looking for things that you would have to pull away. Totally understood. It sounds fine, just the way that it is. This is the EQ that's on uh, this particular vocal channel up here. It's not on right now. This is turning it on and it highlights over here and this is turning it off, okay? So it's not running in the audio clip that you just heard. I'm gonna solo this voice, I'm gonna play that same amount. And now the end is near. There's some other audio things going on up here. And so I face the final curtain. There's some other audio things going on over here, but we don't have to worry about those right now. We just want to worry about only the EQ itself. And can I get a thumbs up from the room that you can see this EQ? I know the Zoom is sort of weird about. Okay, great. Thank you so much. What love the responsiveness of the room. Okay, so. I'm going to turn on the EQ and then I'm going to reverse these so that we can hear what exactly happens because we didn't even know that these were issue frequencies before. Okay. I'm going to put it back here. In fact, I'm just going to create a band around just these four so that we get really used to hearing just those. Okay. And I'm going to mess with, I'm going to turn off this one and then I'm going to, it's this one. Okay. I'm going to mess with this one itself. Okay. And now the end is near. And so I hear that sound sort of like the audio is being played down a like a hollow metal pipe. That's something that you would know is there when the band is back down here. And now but if you go fishing for it, the end is near. You can find it again. So it's through the process of deducing where the problem is and then reducing the frequency that we can actually find these nodes and where we want to sort of scoop them out. I'm gonna do the same thing over here. And now, very different. The end is near. Very different kind of a frequency-based problem, but 
sort of a similar solution where we just want to and now scoop it out the end is near right around 3000 okay and just to like level the playing field when it comes to understanding frequencies by hearing them this is something that i've seen different audio engineers and audio files do over time this is not something i do particularly well i think i my brain sort of works on a four-part parametric eq sort of like what you might see in garage and understanding well maybe that's high mid and maybe that's um low mid and maybe that's really really low and i want to um put on a, a low cut or something like that but no one is expecting anyone else i don't think in this day and age to really pick these out of out of thin air okay but it does help to understand there might be something there that i need to look for and find and then take out of the picture in order to make the sound a bit more resonant and of course i would be remiss if i didn't just play it with the backing track and now the end is near and so i face the final curtain and that sounds tons better than it would have if we had paid no attention whatsoever to what could possibly be there and try to hunt out some of the, we'll call them audio inefficiencies that are in the picture. So how do I want to relate that to what it is that we're talking about today? Well, there are always ways in which the, we can use technology, especially when we sort of boil down definitions of technology to its very sort of basic and foundational definition and definitions. There are always ways in which we can use and utilize technology that will make our lives easier and make our lives just a bit more fun. In some cases, it's like a, a we're um, sort of replacing a whole function of the way that we operate. And in some ways, we might just want to replace one integral component of how the things that we have working well intersect with one another. But it's up to us to figure that, figure that out. It's up to us to figure out, well, you know, do I really need that super duper fancy metronome? Or do I really need something that plugs into my headphones? Or do I really just need to use uh, my phone on um, one of the, you know, 100 metronome apps that's free and just use that as the way of getting better at keeping time? Again, but or do I really need the really fancy Dr. Beat that counts out the numbers and all sorts of tuplets and all those types of things, which is very, very fun. I mean, I have one right right next to me. And I do love toys. So it's <laughs> very understandable that I would be found with such a thing. You have to ask yourself, well, how do I know my relationship with the things around me that'll make my um, journey through my musical life a lot easier and better. And then the second thing I want to discuss today is that of a portfolio career. What does it mean to have a portfolio career? What does it mean to make or design a portfolio career? What does it mean to curate the portfolio career that will make us most happy? And of course, how do we maintain a portfolio career that will assure us uh, a diverse set of income streams for the future? Okay. And just to circle back to that question, if you haven't written anything down for that uh, for that orig original question, the question was, what's the question that you're too afraid to ask because you should have known it already? You should have known the answer to it already. So let me give you a, a, a background of, of what it is that I do, okay? And I'm going to talk you through how I got to the place where I am now, but I'll also talk a bit about uh what i've done in the last two weeks i think that i think the last two weeks is a reasonable depiction of what my day-to-day -day, uh what for whatever that's worth day-to-day -day. that means I mean, anything i'm flying to los angeles tomorrow what is it what is a day-to-day -day, you know but right now my butt is is seated in uh, a chair in new york city and uh again though first i'll talk about what it is how that is that i that i got here so i um completed a bachelor's of music degree uh, and then I moved to a big city to sort of figure things out with, with the understanding that I wanted to go into a master's program. And um, I got a few internships and basically started working immediately and then went into a jazz master's degree and then went into an MBA. That was partially because my undergraduate degree was in music business, a very rare degree, a BM in music business, um, only exists in a few places. And it's basically, best way to think about it is it's a music ed degree, except everything you do uh, when, you know, the education majors are off doing stuff like music teaching learning or principles of music education, 
I was doing principles of macro and micro account um, economics and principles of management, uh, marketing, accounting, stuff like that. So when I got out, I felt, well, I must sort of carry this vision further. I must sort of be more of what it is that I am. And I'm glad. I'm, I feel very equipped um, to, to be the best version of myself, given the, given the path that I've had and all the wines that it took through different schooling opportunities. But all those schooling opportunities, getting that uh, first master's degree in jazz and the second master's degree in business administration, both of those opportunities... Um, went on without me ever leaving the scene. So the playing scene here here in New York. So I um, I started gigging pr pretty much immediately. I got pretty heavy in the wedding band scene. Um, and that actually prompted my wife and I to start a company a couple of years later when I was in the, my second master's degree. Um, and when, again, when we first got in, I got a, a sort of a leg up. A person connected me to... A person who was moved, moving out of New York connected me to a person in New York who had a ton of gigs. So I did uh, a ton of playing. Uh, and you know what's really interesting about that is that at no at no at no juncture at any point, I guess, in any time of my my career, did, has anyone ever asked me for my sort of degree credentials? So I, I sort of established in my mind early on that the things that I was doing in the educational sphere were more for me than for someone else. Clearly, um, designating that I had. Uh, talent, ambition, drive, or a sort of pedigree to to do a job because no one's ever asked me that in a recording situation um, or a playing situation. So, anyways, back to this sort of like winding, weaving road of of where it is that I've been. As soon as I got out of that MBA, I went into a doctoral program because I knew that there were some things that I wanted to accomplish in the realm of academia. Again, all the while though. Um, all the while, I, I never stopped playing. The business was well underway at this point. It was about two years old by the time that I went to this doctoral program. And uh, my outside uh, like playing opportunities hadn't really slowed down. Um, and that was a, a really interesting place to be in because it, it also reminded me or taught me, maybe taught me for the first time, that certain things of certain value to some people in my life and career wouldn't be of value of the same amount of value to others in along my journey. And that doesn't mean anything bad about any of those people. Just the same way that when we have different perspective, um, professors telling us different perspectives, one perspective doesn't devalue another perspective. These are all valued perspectives that we need to take into our mind and then mull them all over and make the decisions, again, about the technology, the path, the opportunities that we would like to engage in. We have to then take all of those things in and make some newly educated decisions about how we run our own life, how we take care of our own business. And one of the most um, humbling moments, I'll say, was the day I was about halfway through my dissertation. And this was maybe a year where I was doing a lot of um, messing around. I've, 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 um, I'm, known, I'm known to have messed around in the midst of my degrees. I think uh, at the end of my bachelor's degree, I was playing in eight ensembles, which is ridiculous. Now that I'm on the other side of the curricular fence and trying to help folks make curricular decisions, I think to myself, what was I doing? But I was obsessed with playing all these different instruments, concert bass, clarinet, and alto saxophone, and barry sax, and piano, and this group, and flute in this ensemble. And I had the chops to be able to do it. So I thought, why not? <laughs> why not just run about the place? But in my, you know, continued gallivanting, when I was in my doctoral degree, I, um, I had played a morning show that morning. I'd played Good Morning America. And if you don't know anything about those shows, they, they, they have you get there at like two in the morning or three in the morning. And a car comes and gets you from a place wherever you're staying in the, in the local city. So um, the car picks you up just to make sure. It's like a limousine looking like thing. Picks you up and drops you off there. And I'm over the moon. I'm like, this is crazy that I get to do this. This is amazing and unbelievable that I get to play with this person, get to play this music and get to do this thing for a couple million people on a random day of the week. I think it was a Friday. No, it was a, it was a middle of the week. Because I remember when I got to the university, everyone was, everyone was there. And um, I played this whole thing, went off without a hitch, which was amazing given that I was running 
uh, main stage in live performance. And we'll talk about what main stage is later. But Spark Notes version, uh, for those of you who don't know, it's a $30 program that uh, can do everything that you want it to do. But I wouldn't stake my life on it because it's been known to crash a lot. <laughs> it it is, does not have the reputation of something like Ableton Live, for example. So um, all that just to say, when I, when I came in, because I took a little nap after I got done playing that morning show, and then I came into, um, came into TC, Teachers College, where I, got, where I work and then also got my doctorate, uh, it was clear that nobody cared. Nobody cared, not even a little bit. This thing, this grandiose thing that I, that for myself, it was a grandiose accomplishment for me that I, that I had done. Um, and they were much more worried about me uh, tending to my fellowship responsibilities. The fellowship was the, the job that I had as an academic there. And then also um, they were worried about me completing my dissertation. And it's not to say that those things weren't important. It was just very clear to me that different people had different interests in my path. Very important, but good to acknowledge as we're making our way as we're making our way through this. So again, that was, uh, those were a bunch of the sort of memories from the doctoral program and then how we land where, we, where I am now. Well, I still do a lot of those things. I never sort of let go of those different things because they all sort of fed into my version of what a portfolio career would be. My version of a portfolio career involves playing, performing, um, some type of scholarly expeditions for sure. And then, of course, some type of a well-integrated, um, well-integrated life. Okay, so something where I feel like I wouldn't use the word balance because I, I never, I always feel like I'm on a tightrope, and maybe balance isn't the, the quite quite the right word that I would use, but that's that's what I would feel would go into a good version of my portfolio career. So let's talk about the last two weeks and how maybe those things lead into the last two weeks, and then again we're going to get into how technology plays specific roles in that. So uh, about two weeks ago, or I'll go back to two weeks ago Sunday, it was a pretty typical week for me. I teach in the mornings at one institution, and then I have meetings throughout the middle portion of the day for my company. All of this is scheduled really tightly in a series of applications, but most notably, Google Calendar. Most notably, all this stuff is going to look like sort of a, um, a rainbow in my Google Calendar I'm thinking whether I should, whether or not I should show you folks my Google Calendar looks like because it sort of looks like a um, like a like an assortment of colors, but I'll I'll, I'll shield your eyes from that for right now. <laughs> Maybe in the second session if someone asks about that. But it started off with a with typical week with the teaching in the morning, the meetings in the uh, in the in the middle of the afternoon, and then um, some later teaching and meetings that are of a sort of a different configuration on the tail side of the day with some space in the evenings for catching up on readings, um, rehearsing, uh, performing, and then of course doing any type of like music learning slash digital audio workstationing that I would need to do on the tail end of a day. Then um, in the last week, the tail end of last week, I actually went to a conference. So that would mean that I would have to move around some of my obligations um, to fit this conference obligation because I saw this way of meeting other people, engaging with them in a, in a meaningful way in person as a way of sort of um, pushing my career goals along. Because it's one thing for me to think of thoughts. It's one thing for me to design um, functional digital audio station workspaces. It's one, for me to, one, one thing for me to think about how conceptual models move through time in a pedagogical space. But it's a whole other thing for me to get from others and talk about that thing. Because if you can get in front of others and you can talk about or vet the thing that you have, it totally changes the game. It totally changes how you're actually interfacing with your craft. Because it's one thing when you um, put together a sound, but it's a whole other thing when you, especially if, you're, if you work in a synthesizer or in a digital audio workstation, which is primarily my craft now. My first degree was in saxophone. My first two degrees were in saxophone, but I um, play a lot more keys right now, especially in, in musical director roles. And I'll tell you, oh my goodness, this happened to me three weeks ago. Um, we, in one of the cover groups that I work in in New York, I play, get, play with this group a couple times a week in a couple of clubs here in New York. And um, I thought I had a sound that was good enough for um, 
the synth line that's in a Harry Styles song called As It Was. And I was so wrong. I was so wrong that I had this sound together. And how did I know that I was wrong? Because when I played the line, none of the rest of the band came in because they were like, what is that? How, what are we even supposed to do to, to acknowledge what it is that you have just played? I have no, I have no clue what, it, what I'm even supposed to do to what it is that, you, that, you've just, that you've just done. And I knew immediately like, okay, this doesn't, this doesn't even sound close. I am playing the right notes, but it's not doing the right thing. I need to take this one back home and sort of figure it out. Cause I, I didn't do my homework on it, frankly. I'll, I'll take ownership for that. I definitely didn't do what I was supposed to do. But went home, tried a couple of layers, tried a couple of um, layers on top of each other that would sort of do, I sort of deconstructed the sound that I was looking for in my head and then reconstructed those layers inside of my keyboard using my uh, computer as an interface because you can actually plug, with most keyboards these days, you can plug them into a computer and a program will open up on your computer that sort of gets you inside of your keyboard. And for those of you who don't know what the Nord um, keyboard interface looks like when you're actually looking at the keyboard, it's very small. It's like the size of an index card. So you can't really do too much on that. And it helps to sort of root around on a much larger screen. So of course, when I came back the next week, the sound was like over the moon better. It was, it was so much more on the money that it helped the rest of the group come in at just the right time. And that's the thing about how we can utilize particular components of music tech, like how we layer in a reverb or how we layer in any particular component of sonic design or how we um, maybe use MIDI information to tell us certain things, or even better, how do we use MIDI information to tell the computer to do certain things? The show that I'm flying to LA for has a specific a specific instance of that where the very good friend of mine who programmed it put in particular notes that Ableton would read in a particular track that tell Ableton, hey, go on to the next track now. Or it tells Ableton, hey, stop. Stop dead in your tracks. Don't do a thing ne next. Don't do a single other thing until you are told, you know, until you hear from me. Okay? So uh, on, one, on, one, on one hand, we have sort of like, here's how technology can make our life easier in the moment by having to by sort of saving us a button click. And then we have the other, here's how technology can actually enhance the experience for the listener. Here's how technology can enhance the experience for the performer. Here's how technology can enhance the experience for every single person in the room and make more meaning out of the experience that we're having together. If you're not necessarily familiar with constructivist philosophies, this sort of holds that pedagogically or andragogically, meaning adult education wise, we want for everyone to be sort of constructing the meaning for themselves in a pedagogical or learning environment. So I can't necessarily say how, I can't necessarily say how someone else is going to hear something or feel about something once I play it in, but I do want them to have a reaction. I do want them to have a reaction. I always say that it's not um, that when I'm teaching my, uh, especially my music education classes, I say it's never my job to know, but it's always my job to foster exploration. Always my job to foster exploration. And one of the questions I'd have for you is, well, how do you want to foster that sort of sonic exploration in the, um, the sort of picture that you create for people when you're either playing something, facilitating a musical picture, or whether you created something that's, um, that's going to be recorded? So uh, I wrote down a, cu a couple points of notes. I know that we're about 15 minutes away from the break, and I do want to leave some, some spots and some time for questions before we break and then move. But some of the quick things that I wrote down that I use on a, I'd say, day-to-day -day basis were Logic, meaning that program that you just saw, Logic Pro, the Nord board that I have, which is a stage three. Um, Zoom and how I use Zoom on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis and how you might be able to use Zoom on a week-to-week -week basis. Um, the whole Google suite, because Google can solve most problems. Um, I say two things can solve most problems, Google and money. And that's, um, we haven't talked too much about, about business in, in, this, uh, in this sphere yet, but I'd be happy to field questions about my business, other business, ways of thinking about businesses, um, 
price point selling pricing things um uh, commercial entities all the all the things i'd be happy to answer questions about any of those things um calendly you don't know what calendly is this is a scheduling piece of software so you don't actually have to do the scheduling for yourself uh the whole microsoft suite vocoders and different types of vocoders and talk boxes and how cool they can possibly be um synthesizer pads meaning things like spd pads there's also uh there's also a, a small finger pad that i use because i'm a I'm a keyboard player, so I don't have sticks in my hand and I can't be hitting on a, a synth pad like an SPD in real live performance. So there are some other ways of getting around that issue when you want to trigger sounds. But those are just some of the things that I thought, oh, well, maybe since I use these things on a, on a recurring basis and I have a lot of fun doing them, that we might be able to, that we might be able to talk about. The only other thing that I wanted to share before we dive into questions was sort of diving back to this whole concept of the reductive EQ and this, this deducing and then reducing something. So with, when it comes to technology and how we use technology, one thing I'd implore you to do is look at the different things that you do. Look at the different things that you that make up your day-to-day -day life the things that may cause you some grief, frankly, the things that you think are fun, the things that you spend a lot of time doing. Think about those things individually and think, well, how could I infuse technology or automation in order to make this in some way, shape, or form easier, less redundant, or more engaging? You don't necessarily want to reduce that thing, but you might want to, you might want to um, expand the use of technology in that particular sphere. And then of course, with sculpting a portfolio career, you want to do the same kind of an exercise, right? You want to look at what are the things that I do on a day-to-day -day basis that I like. Right now, you may only have but so much sort of curricular control over what it is that you can do and not do and still get away with um, passing all your classes and absolutely, you know, crushing it in a, in a curricular sphere. But it doesn't mean that you can't think ahead and think, well, this is a portion that if I had my way, I probably wouldn't include in the next version of what my career looks like because your career's already started right you're already forming connections with those around you these are the people who are going to call you for jobs gigs opportunities recommendations in the future that's a really big part of um of the educational system in this country and, and 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 in plenty of other countries and systems these are networks that you're that you're that you're building so what do I want to include more of in the future as far as those networks? And what do I want to include more of as far as those experiences are concerned? And then try to open up those doors for yourself to make for a sort of an easier passage forward. So now with about 10 minutes, I think it's a good time to open up for some questions about just about anything. I'm really an open book. I can talk about business. We can talk about music. We can talk about music production. We can talk about performing. We can talk about Keyboards, synthesizers, sounds, saxophones, reeds. We can talk about um, recipes for foods. I am a bit of a foodie myself. Uh, I was curious, uh, maybe some more of the big names that we might have recognized of people you've worked with, like Harry Styles. Oh, no, 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 no. no, 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 no. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> My voice is coming through really loud. Again, I haven't worked with Harry Styles. What I was saying is that I covered the music of Harry Styles, and that's an instance in which I needed to... Um, in which I needed to cop that particular sound because, you know, whether you're playing to a room of 300 or you're playing to a room of 30,000, you still need to have the right, the right type of sound. Make sense. I'm sorry if my, if the stories were confusing, the woman I was playing with, um, the woman I was playing with a couple of years ago, her name was Erin Bowman. And she had a couple hits that did a couple of things are still aired in some like commercials these days, but I was not playing with Harry Styles, especially not a couple of years ago, because he's much more famous more recently. Uh, I'll ask a question. Um, sure, sure. You mentioned um, portfolio career and maybe just to, maybe you can just elaborate on that just to be really clear about what that means. Kind of sounds like trying to diversify the things that you are good at. Sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I would think of a portfolio career as a way of using the diverse assets of what it is that you're good at, using your multi-hyphenate sort of to, um, to act as revenue streams or ways of engaging with the community. So um, I also like the way that you, Professor Schaefer, said it, where you said, um, 
you know, diversifying what it is that you do, but you, each of you already has a bunch of talents inside of you. You have a bunch of things that you do or a bunch of things that maybe other people would say that you do or things that you're known for. What you have to focus on is trying to make sure that those things work their way into your sort of career lexicon. So some of them might be like leadership. Some of that might be playing. Some of that might be teaching. Some of that might be recording. A big space growth area right now is Ableton programming. If you know how to program Ableton, which is not super duper difficult to do, it's just as difficult to learn as any other component of our of our trade. But if you can do that, then people will fly you across the country to play with them because it's important that they have someone who understands that particular thing. But how much how much time am I spending in Ableton over the course of a week? I'd say less than less than five hours, maybe or so. But it's one of the things that I do. And it's one of the things that I want for people to know that I do. So likewise, with each one of you, you may think about these easiest two are in, in uh, music programs really to think about is performing and educating. Those are two quick ones because a lot of people have, most people have had a, a private um a private teacher at some point or some type of like private instruction. Most people who are in music schools, I should say, it's a really big qualifier for being in music school it, for better or worse um, is having had pri uh, private instruction. So you see that model, you can also play. And then when you go out on your own career, you can just, you can decide that those are two things that are in your portfolio. You might also want to do some clinicking, meaning that you do some uh, all county festivals where you show up and then you clinic a group and then you get paid to be there for a day of clinicking and be there for the day of the concert and then you go back home you fly back home or take a train back home that might be really interesting to you as well you may want to get into some instrumental repair if that's something that you have a mind for and have hands for those are all components of things and i'm not saying oh everyone needs to do this thing but what i am saying is if you have um a sort of a tendency, a proclivity towards doing this, an affinity for this stuff, you would be, um, you you would be uh, silly to sort of water down your talents, right? If you have, if you have a strong ability to do this, uh, this kind of work that is outside of a, a sort of a narrow iteration of what your career could possibly be, you you should really explore what that could possibly mean for you, because if you're the one person who can do two of those things super duper well, it's very, very likely that you'll be head and shoulders above some of your peers who didn't take the time to um, diversify uh, the way that they're seen and the way that they're valued as a community member. Great, thanks. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, you mentioned using a, a program with Ableton Live. Uh, mm -hmm. Is that for like live sound reinforcement or what are the applications of that? Oh boy, Ableton can do just about anything except for sliced bread. And I just think that it can slice bread. I just don't know if I have a particular slicer that I can hook it up to yet. Um, I'll actually share it on my screen. I'm going to open it up and then share it on my screen so you can see. In fact, I'll show you the session that I'm working on for this um, week. And this is going to be for live sound. I've seen people use this for, um, I've seen people use this for as a digital audio workstation for recording, but I can't get into it. I think that in my opinion, uh, recover your work. Yes. Um, in my opinion, I don't really like how Ableton looks as a, as a recording digital audio workstation. It, the buttons aren't um, diverse enough. It doesn't quite do what it really needs to as far as helping me understand what's going on. But I think in, in live performance, what you're, what I'm going to show you here is what this thing is, is capable of. There's nothing that matches this in live performance. Okay. So what this basically is, is it's a series of tracks that are um, grouped together. And there is a series of tracks that are grouped together. Like for example, all of the Vox tracks are here um, and all the guitar tracks are here and all the keys tracks are here um, and the percussion and drum tracks are here. 
And these are different songs, okay? So when you click on any one of these, it'll, it <clears throat> will start playing. Like you click on this and you press space. I'm just gonna change my audio settings, of course, to make sure that it'll do what it's supposed to do. Driver type, uh, 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 uh. zoom. Okay. Intro, two, three. Could you folks hear that? Yeah. And say intro really, really loud. Okay, great. So there's a, there's a Q track or a Karen track in this, as we call her Karen. Um, and Karen helps us along by, by telling us exactly where we're supposed to be. Okay. Some of the songs have Karen in multiple places, like this one here. Um, and some of them just have right at the beginning. And some just to say like, well, here's, here's a verse coming up. So sort of get it together because we're, because we're all going to the verse together, especially in times in which there's some talking, we need to know exactly what's happening in each one of these sections. Okay. So how this is used, let me just go down to the drum track so you can see a lot of the drum tracks have been stripped away or deactivated because we don't want to be playing the kick that's in the album recording in the live performance we want for the drummer to have some breathing room but we do want like some other points of percussion to be there other points of percussion other points of effects maybe if there are three four or five keyboards or effects layers in a performance we want some of those effect layers to be there but we don't want all of those effect layers to be there if um, there's a keyboard player covering most of those sounds and that's that's my job here primarily is to cover those and whenever you're negotiating what's in one of these Ableton tracks, you have, you have to sort of figure out who do I have and who do I um, need to essentially fill in for. In this particular concert uh, configuration, there's no bass player. So all the bass tracks are fully 100% in here. So if I was to play, let's say, um, I'll just start off with Better With You. It's fine. Intro, two, three, four. Again, I told you that Karen's going to tell us sort of where where we are, right? Drums in, two, three, four. But you don't hear a difference there because there's an actual drum drummer. That would have kicked things up just a couple notches. This entire time, the singer's talking. The singer is talking this entire time. And she's sharing anecdotes with the audience. And she's saying, basically, hey, Come on, we're gonna go on a sonic ride right now. Verse. It's gonna be amazing. Two, Here we go. One, two, three, four. And then she comes in right there. And again, like I just said, all this time the bass is playing because there's no bass player in our in our four person on stage setup. And the drummer is filling in all those extra gaps. Me and the guitar player are also like chopping it up just a little bit to create some energy and some hype. And you can reprogram it, program in that stuff. Like there are a bunch of um, sort of uh, deactivated tracks like this that you can always put back in if you want to. But if you don't want to, you take them right away and then you play uh, live as it were. And it's that side, that sort of relationship that a lot of people know nothing about that makes the live concerts that you folks have been to in your lives, the, the ones that include like heavy technology and like that hook in with the lights and the staging configurations changing and all that stuff. This is the technology that makes that stuff possible.